he's been at the forefront of the battle to contain COVID-19. My kind of 30-year journey of working on virus evolution, how they jump species, it's kind of got me to this point looking at SARS-CoV-2. Australian virologist Professor Eddie Holmes was one of the first people to publicly release the genome sequence of the virus. I felt as a Western scientist under great obligation to get this data out there. And he thinks the world needs to be ready for future outbreaks. It's an obvious reflection of the way humans live. So it's going to happen more. I think climate change and pandemics go hand in hand. Professor Eddie Holmes, the fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, is this year's winner of the Prime Minister's Prize for Science, and now sits down to discuss the year that was and what's still ahead with the Academy's Chief Executive, Anna Maria Arabia. Eddie, congratulations on being awarded the Prime Minister's Science Prize. You must be thrilled about this honour. Uh, thank you, Anna-Maria. Yeah, look, it's, it's an amazing honour. Very unexpected, um, but it's, um, in fact, I'm almost still, haven't quite come to terms with it, but it's, it's, a, it's a great privilege. Uh, Eddie, look, you've been studying the evolution of viruses for more than 30 years. Can you briefly explain your work and what led to this award? Yeah, so by training, I'm an evolutionary biologist, and over the years I've worked on a number of different things. Before I got into viruses, I started off working on primates, then I, got on, then I worked on fruit flies and I thought I'd get even smaller. So then I worked on, on viruses for maybe sort of 30 years now. And what I'm most interested in is how viruses are able to jump from one species to another, which they do all the time. If you're, if you're a virus, you're kind of, your life's goal is really to get from one host to another, in, sometimes in different species. So most, much of my work has been trying to understand exactly how viruses do that. And it couldn't be more relevant than it is today as we're fighting this pandemic. Uh, let's go back to where this started. Why did you decide to study virology and how did you become interested in infectious diseases? Actually, my first degree is in anthropology. So I was actually really interested in, in human evolution, actually. So where humans have come from and our kind of, our kind of evolutionary ancestry. Um, and that's the, I'm still very interested in that story. The problem was human evolution is actually really slow. And you can, you can look at fossils, but you, it's, you can't really watch it in real time. You can't even watch it kind of in front of you. But viruses evolve extremely quickly. It's like a million times faster than human genes do. So it's like evolution on fast forward. Which, so if you're an evolutionary biology, a biologist, that kind of allows you to kind of study them in, in, in more detail, more quickly. So it really is like watching it in real time. So that's the kind of reason intellectually why I, I, I work on virus evolution and why particularly I got into it was um, when I was working on fruit flies, that was in Northern California, quite close to San Francisco, and I spent all my days in the lab because kind of, you know, studying fruit flies and how they're evolving quite slowly. And then just down the road, like I said, was San Francisco, this was, this was 1990, and that was almost like the peak of AIDS deaths in, in San Francisco at that time. So it was a terrible pa pandemic at that point, and there was no antivirals, people were dying in very large numbers. And then I saw a talk by a, a, a colleague from the UK talking about how the AIDS virus, HIV, was evolving. And I thought, actually, why don't I use what I'm, the techniques that I'm doing on fruit flies? Why don't I use the same kind of ideas on, on HIV? Because it, it's evolving rapidly, so I can watch it in real time. Plus, there's a kind of practical outcome of this. I can you know, help understand how HIV evolves and maybe kind of help control it. So that's kind of, I, I pivoted my research, kind of changed in 1990 from yeah, from flies to viruses. Eddie, you were born in the UK and you've mentioned San Francisco and now you're in Australia. What brought you to our shores? I've been in the US, I've lived in the US for, I've, been, I've moved a lot in my career. I was in the US for sort of 10 years prior to Australia. I wanted a new challenge. I, I, I thought, and I still do, Australia I think is a, is a great place to, to do science. I wanted to be in, in the Asia Pacific. I thought that was, that's kind of where the, 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 the world was sort of shifting in, in focus, this region. Um, I had wanted to work more in a kind of, you know, the Asian, Asian region. And Boone to Australia kind of allowed that all, all to kind of happen in, in one place. So um, I moved here in, in 2012, I'm an Australian citizen now. Um, and it's been by far the best move I've ever made. And I'm very happy to be here. Oh, it's fantastic. It's so, so good to hear that. Eddie Holmes, you were one of the first people to publicly release the genome sequence of SARS-CoV-2, the virus which causes COVID-19. Can you explain why you did that? Yeah, so what happened was um, I, I first heard about um, what is now COVID-19 on, I think it was December the 31st, 2019. 
And there's a, there's a wonderful pro, uh, website called ProMed that kind of posts daily uptake, uh, updates of diseases. And I read this post of um, four cases of pneumonia in uh, Wuhan associated with, with a, um, a market. And I, I've been to Wuhan, I've actually been to this market. So I thought, that's, that's very, you know, what I've done, where I've been. So I contacted my, my colleagues in, in, in China uh, on New Year's Day 2020 to say, you know, Happy New Year, are you working on this? Can I help? And then my, my, my good friend and, and colleague, Professor Zhang Zheng Zhang from Fudan, um, he said he was working on, on the virus because we actually had a project ongoing in Wuhan anyway on just on respiratory diseases. So he managed to get hold of some early samples and they were sent to his lab on January the 3rd, um, 2020. And then 40 hours later, he'd sequenced the complete genome. So 40 hours from sample arriving to find the pathogen. Go back to HIV, it took two years to show that HIV was the cause of AIDS. Here it took 40 hours. So we had the genome sequence um, on January the 5th. We talked on that day and um, he, we decided that we had to get it, the, the data to the authorities as quickly as possible. So he wrote to the Ministry of Health in China on that day and said, look, it's a new virus. It's a coronavirus. It looks a bit like, like s the first SARS virus. Um, people should take precautions because this could be respiratory pathogens. We kind of could see that from the genome sequence. So that's January the 5th and on that day, as at that point, there were still there were very few cases in Wuhan, maybe you know, a, a small numbers of tens, ten or twenty or so. And then it's, as the week wore on, we, although we told the local authorities, um, the case ca count was slowly increasing, and the Ministry of Health in China were, were in control of information, so we couldn't do anything without their their approval. But as the week wore on, that, that um, second week of January, it, it became clear to me that the world wanted to know what. The, the genome sequence was, the case numbers were rising, it was becoming more and more important to share this information. I never had the sequence myself, I'd, I'd helped and I'd analyze the data without actually having the, 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 the genetic code of the virus myself. And you know, the pressure um, rose and I felt, I felt as a Western scientist under great obligation to, to, to get this data out there. Um, and then I think it was like the, the Friday night there was a, a tweet from so it's Sir Jeremy Farrow, who's the director of the Wellcome Trust, and he basically said, if this virus is out, if the sequence is known, it should be released. And I thought, I need to do this right now. This, is, this has got to, it's got to breaking point. So I, I contacted Zhang, Professor Zhang in China, and I kind of convinced him we had to release it. And so um, he was actually on a plane going from uh, Shanghai to Beijing. So he, I called him on a, on a plane and the, the, the flight attendant was saying, put your phone down, sir. But he said, okay, okay, we, we release, we release. And so he contacted his lab, um, lab manager. They sent me the, the genome sequence, first time I had it. And then I spent 52 minutes just running a kind of a, a little description of what the sequence was, running a tweet and I put it out there um, as fast as I could on January the 10th Australian time. And um, that then, I think, kind of marked the, the scientific fight back against the virus. Having that sequence allowed tests for the virus to be developed and vaccines to be designed very, very quickly. What an extraordinary story. And what a modern scientific story, Eddie. I mean, you know, it had all of the elements, uh, didn't it? A, a, a genome sequence that was critical, uh, the importance of international collaboration, the importance of sharing information, and it was shared by Twitter. And if I can say, Amri, I think the, the one thing I've learned from all of this is that, is that you know, share, the whole pandemic, sharing your data as rapidly as possible is absolutely critical. At the time we shared that, it wasn't clear this would be a pandemic. There were still, there weren't that many cases. It was probably not even on the news in most countries, but it was already beginning, you know, we, 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 I sensed this had to be done. Now, even more so, the importance of, of that act and data sharing in general has become much more you know, obvious to me and, um, and everyone else. And I think for, for going forward to how to prevent the next pandemic is absolutely critical. We build structures that allow scientists to share data in as freely, as openly and rapidly as possible. That, that's the biggest lesson I think I've learned from the whole pandemic. In that too, Eddie, there's an enormous act of scientific integrity and I personally thank you and I know the world thanks you too uh, because without that, uh, without that commitment to transparency and scientific integrity, we may not be where we are today. Did you have any idea back then in January 2020 
that this virus would spread and become the widespread pandemic that we now find ourselves in almost two years later. When it first hit, um, so when I first heard about it, first week of January, I thought as case numbers started to go up, I thought, well, this would be like SARS-1. So SARS-1 emerged in 2002, 2003 in southern China, in Guangdong province. Um, to me, it felt like that because the virus was very closely related. So I thought maybe this will spread to, you know, a few cities, uh, a localised outbreak, you know, maybe a few thousand cases. And at that week, that first week in China, no one had died either. Um, as time wore on, I mean, wore on pretty quickly, the case numbers started to increase and I started to get more worried. And by about the third week of January, um, the virus had got to other countries. And at that point, I, I think I flipped from this, this is, this is going to be more than a localised outbreak. This virus is very infectious. It's going to be a big thing. And that, I think, was the big difference in to SARS-1 to SARS-2 and why my kind of my mindset changed, because by about the third week, it became pretty clear this virus was far more infectious than, than the first SARS virus. And in particular, there was growing evidence that people could transmit the virus asymptomatically. So they weren't, they weren't showing any visible symptoms. In SARS-1, people who transmitted were, were ill. And that's why it was actually easy, easy to control because you could just kind of quarantine those people. SARS-2, COVID-19, if you don't, if you, your worst case scenario is, is the silent spread, the person you're sitting next to on the train or the bus you don't know is infected. That's what SARS-2 was. And as soon as that became clear and the virus started to leak out into other countries, I thought, OK, this is going to be a, be, a, be a big thing. And by, by early February, um, the pandemic in my mind was clearly going to be a very, a very major thing indeed. What does your research indicate in terms of the trajectory of COVID-19 did we predict the Delta variant? And what does research tell us might yet come? Delta was a surprise to me. I thought, you know, if you asked me a, a, um, a year ago what would happen, I, I'd, I'd have said to you the virus will probably stay much the same as it is now. It probably won't get much more infectious, probably won't get much more virulent. And gradually we'll, we'll get on top of it by vaccination. Now that's not the case. The virus is now more virulent and a lot more infectious than it was when it first emerged in Wuhan. I think that's, that certainly took me by surprise. I think looking at the trajectory of the evolution, this is what I, I, I kind of diagnose as what's happened. During 2020, and um, I should just, before I answer that question, should say one big thing about, about COVID is we are looking at this virus in the finest scale anatomy we've ever done before. We, even viruses like influenza and HIV, our scale analysis has not been anywhere near as precise as it has been with SARS-CoV-2. There are now over 4 million genome sequences of viruses available for analysis. It's quite extraordinary. So it's a very, very detailed analysis. Given that, I think what happened was in 2020 and the start of 2021, you were seeing the virus evolve in populations where basically there was no immunity. Okay, everyone was susceptible. The virus could spread in an unfettered way. It's kind of like Saturdays of the virus. And selection, evolution at that, that period was simply for infectiousness, to make the best replicator, the fastest race car you could make. And Delta, without a doubt, won that race by, by a, a distance, right? By a clear distance. Much more than I ever thought. So Delta was the winner in that, sh that race in a population that's generally naive, haven't seen the virus before for sheer infectiousness. Now, in the second half of 2021, you're, you're seeing is a different kind of selective landscape, evolutionary landscape. Now, many people in many countries have got pretty high vaccination rates, some obviously not, sadly, but many are pretty good. So the selection pressure, the evolutionary pressure on the virus is now going to be very, very different. It's not going to be the, the simply the fastest race car that wins, it's going to be the one that's best able to get around that that immunity. Okay, to, to, so selection will favour strains that can reinfect people who already have been immunised against the virus. So that's what selection pressure is going to change. So then I expect we'll get different variants start to come up in the near future that can kind of get around get around immunity and reinfect people. Now, whether they'll be more virulent or more, or more generally infectious is hard to say. Normally in evolution, there are, kind of, there are trade offs. So if you're, if, you're, if you can evade immunity, if you're good at that, you normally can't do something else. So it's quite hard to say exactly what the future virus will, you know, the Delta of the future will look like. But 
it will be different than we've got now because again the evolutionary pressure is changed we're now in a world now it's going to evolve in a world where people are immune rather than the, rather than last year when people are not immune so is it correct to say there are at least two pathways to that evolution. One is to transmit uh, in populations that have lower vaccination, and the other is to transmit and adapt to a vaccinated population, and that could lead to a multitude of variants across the world. I think that's very well put, that's exactly correct. So in, in countries with low rates of immunisation, and some are actually on Australia's borders, obviously, um, Evolution, the pressure on the virus will be very different than it is here with a very highly vaccinated pressure. And so you'll see different, you may see different variants being favoured in different populations in exactly the same sorts of way as you're suggesting. The way I like to think about viruses though is that, is that although they can do lots of things and they can adapt very well, there are constraints. They can't do everything, okay? So normally things that are very infectious are not very virulent all the other way around. Only things that are very virulent often not very infectious, not that it's infectious. So there are kind of these complicated trade-offs. So if you try and favor one thing, you, you, have to, you have to kind of reduce something else. So it's a bit like having a, a Swiss army knife, right? So viruses are kind of compact and can do lots of things, but you can't do much more because you, you've got to fit into this one little knife. So for example, in, in a Swiss army knife, you have a pair of scissors, right? That's kind of like a bit small, it can cut a bit of paper, but it can't cut anything big. To make a bigger pair of scissors in an army knife, you'd have to kind of like make it bigger, you know, stronger. But to do that, you'd have to remove some of the other blades. So you can, if you want to favor one thing, you have to remove something else. So the virus is going to be kind of in this kind of complicated evolutionary trade-off. It can't, it's, its elbow room is limited to some extent. So quite how that will play out though is quite, is a, is a complicated kind of set of nuances and trajectories and it's quite hard to predict exactly what it will be like. It's an excellent analogy, thank you. I'll never look at a Swiss army knife for the <laughs> same again. I think. Eddie, there's been a lot of debate about where the virus originated. What does the scientific evidence show? I think the most, I think the, the scientific evidence as of today tells us this, that the most closely related viruses we have to SARS-CoV-2 are in bats, particularly these horseshoe bats. They're very common in, in Southeast Asia and, and Southern China. And the closest we found so far are actually from horseshoe bats in Laos, so Northern Southeast Asia. And they're about 96.8% similar. So you've got SARS-CoV-2 and the closest bat virus, it's about 96.8% similar. Now that sounds very close, but in fact, in evolutionary terms, there's still a gap. So it's 3.2%. That's actually still you know, a decade or more, maybe 20 or 30 years even, of evolution. So we're missing, you know, the missing link. We're missing the direct ancestor. We know that bats are the closest, okay, from Laos. Then there's a gap and there's SARS-CoV-2. So the key thing is what's in that gap? Where's in, the, in that gap? Um, clearly, bats do carry lots of these viruses. And I, I strongly expect if we sample more of these horseshoe bats across southern China, even in central China, Southeast Asia, we'll find more viruses that are close, probably even ones even closer than they are um, to SARS-CoV-2. Um, my guess is also that there are other animals out there that will have very, very similar viruses. We know that pangolins do, but I can't believe it's just bats and pangolins. And I strongly suspect the ecology of these viruses in nature involves, there's other species involved there we haven't yet sampled. And so one of the key things is to try and sample more of the kind of the natural ecology of these viruses to see what viruses are out there. Going back to these, these, these bats from Laos, not only are they very, they're very genetically close, the critical thing is they have a bit of sequence called the receptor binding domain. You can imagine the virus is like a lock and a key, virus in the cells like a lock and a key. So the, vi the cells that lock, the virus is the key, and the virus has to kind of get itself into the lock, tw you know, turn it and get in. That key, that, that binding domain um, in these Lao viruses is remarkably similar to the human key. It's effectively the same thing. So that is the functional core of the virus. It allows the virus to do what it does to infect human cells. That core we know already is there in nature in these bats in, in, in Southeast Asia. So that tells you, the, you know, there are other things, that's two things, one is that if we look more, we'll find more of these viruses that relate. And two, that, that viruses like SARS-CoV-2 can emerge again because 
they're armed and equipped there in nature. So I think it's just a matter of, of sampling more and more animal hosts, bats and other things, to find the closest relative to SARS-CoV-2. That could take time though, so it's not going to be a simple thing. Eddie, you've discussed your idea of developing a global radar system. How would this work and who would develop such a system? So one of the other lessons I, I think we the obvious lesson we learned from COVID-19 is that we have to be able to detect these pathogens as quickly as possible, as soon as they are emerging in humans. Okay, that's a critical thing to do. And we now have the techniques that, that can do that. We now can, we can monitor people who I th and I think the key people to monitor are people who work at or live at the animal interface. So who work in the you know wildlife trade or these animal markets or who live near wildlife, they are at most risk. So what we need is a global organization or global mechanism that allows that kind of radar system to be to be put in place globally and the data shared globally so we can monitor for any unusual disease occurrences in, 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 in human populations, again, particularly people at, who live at the animal interface. How frequent do you think pandemics will occur and what should we be doing to reduce our vulnerability to them? Pandemics have increased in frequency um, in the last few hundred years and it's an obvious reflection of the way humans live. We have bigger populations, we're more connected, we're more, we're, we're more urban, we're denser, we interact more with wildlife species, we have deforestation. So it's going to happen more. And I think climate change is really going to be a, a key driver of this because as climates change, what will happen is that animals will change their distribution too because they're affected by climate change and they're probably grouped together more, allowing viruses to jump more between them. Humans who rely on animal species will need to change their way of, their way of living, their, their livelihoods, their way of acquiring food and they'll probably be exposed to new animal species and new pathogens too. So I think climate change and pandemics go hand in hand. Climate change will get more pandemics. So it's hard to know, put a precise number uh, on the frequency that they're going to happen. But I think, I think it's, it's, it's a racing certainty that we will get more and more of these. If you look at people who live near wildlife, who work in animal markets or live, live near bat caves, they are very commonly exposed to viruses. It happens all the time. Even people in North America um, are very commonly exposed, for example, to, to swine flu viruses. Okay, So they're continually, people handle pigs, work in pig farms, go to pig fairs, but their pig viruses come to humans. So this exposure is happening all the time. Okay, Normally, luckily, they don't go anywhere. So there's one case and it burns itself out. Every so often though, and increasingly often now in this modern world, you get a chance for the virus to get going, cause an epidemic or even a pandemic. So we need to kind of get, get to grips with, with, the, with the prospect this is gonna happen again in the future. And the key lessons I think we need to, to, to prevent this happening again or, or, or prevent, you know, help mitigate as much as possible. I think there are a few of them. One, we need, we need new pl pandemic plans. So, so COVID, our response globally was based on flu. Flu was our model. That was a pretty good model, but COVID wasn't flu. There, are, there were some important differences. We need a pan plans that can um, cope with a, a broader range of viruses. We need that global radar, as I said before. We also need basic research into, into um, vaccines and antivirals that are wet when to, when to go in the freezer ready so rather than waiting you know uh, waiting for a year 18 months to get those vaccines ready they need to be there on site go to freezer okay that's the one i want now that's a massive ask that really is like the apollo project of of, of virology and immunology you need to have viruses that can recognize a broad range of so vaccines that recognize a broad range of viruses ready to go, okay? So we need vaccines to protect against a, a swathe of influenza viruses or a swathe of coronaviruses. That's a big scientific challenge. And, and as yet, we've not really made any universal vaccines for any system, but that has to be a key goal. Anyhow, I'm looking forward to your own research. What are your scientific goals for the next few years? I think I would actually like to play um, a key role in trying to do this, trying to put in place these structures that will try and prevent the next pandemic. And I think um, Australia is in, a, is, a, is in a really good place to do this. I think we have a very good, we have a great scientific infrastructure, a very high quality scientists there. We have um, a, a lot of good biosecurity already in place, but I think it could be better. And I think what I really like to do is try and enhance our national biosecurity 
so that if viruses come in, and they will come in, okay, it's a very, on humans and in other animals coming into this country and in plants too, we can be, are able to respond to those in a much more, um, even more efficient way than we, we did before. In Australia and in most countries, there's actually a division between animals and humans. They're, they're kind of dealt with different. The veterinary community deals with animal virus, animal pathogens, and the medical community deals with human ones. But in fact, they're the same thing. There's, there's this idea called One Health, which, which posits that humans and animals are part of the same ecosystem. We share the same pathogens. That's what COVID taught us as well. And therefore, we need, we need a unifying framework to understand disease in animals and humans. You, you can't separate them. And I think what Australia, what I'd like to do for Australia going forward is help establish a new kind of national biosecurity that uses the kind of techniques that we've used that quickly identified SARS-CoV-2 to, to deploy that to look at other potential emerging threats to Australia and better and therefore help safeguard us against pandemics. I can't think of a better person for the job. You've been awarded the Prime Minister's Prize for Science and in October 2020, you were named the New South Wales Scientist of the Year. And at that time, the Sydney Morning Herald wrote in their editorial that you richly deserve that recognition because your story illustrates the bravery demanded of scientists in the current political environment. You have certainly been brave and worked tirelessly. I know that personally, having called you for scientific advice on a Sunday. But do you find it concerning that scientists need to be brave to undertake research for the public good? Is this just part and parcel of being a modern day scientist? Science is now at the forefront of people's minds and whether they, they think consciously they're talking science, people's understanding of science has increased dramatically. So you actually now ask, you know, the average person, they'll know about genome sequencing. We are, we are, we know what the case numbers, we know what the R value is, okay? So our scientific literacy has massively increased as, as a nation, globally in fact, because of the pandemic. The problem, so that's great. The problem also is that scientists then are then much more in, in the public eye. I've always thought of myself as being a kind of backroom staff, right? I find, I find the public eye slightly disconcerting, but um, it's, it's thrust us in, into, into the limelight, which is something we, I was not expecting. And it did take some adjustment to do that. I think, so now going forward, I think scientists need to understand that, that everything they do and they say people are listening to and there are there are consequences for that so um, we need to be, be aware of that also in the modern age so i mean i used when i released that sequence i used the internet i used, I, I posted it on a website and i announced it on twitter so i used social media and that was an amazingly rapid thing to help respond to the pandemic and social media is an amazing thing it can allow you to and going forward for, for response to pandemics, we need to have tools like social media because they are so quick. And that's what the pandemics need in a quick response. Unfortunately, there's also a downside, which is, which is you, you know, people, some people are very upset by things you do. So we, we, we have to kind of live with this, this, this duality where having, having the public access by social media is an amazing thing. It's a very, very powerful tool, but yet there also there's a, there's a, there's a necessary kind of downside. So... Um, quite how we steer our way through that, I don't really know, but it's, it's going to be there for the future and um, we need to kind of get used to it, I guess. What about life outside of science? You're a dad, you've been in lockdown, you've had to assist with home learning. What have you done to keep balance, to unwind, and particularly at a time when your research is going at such extraordinary intensity? Yeah, I think so. Like most parents in Australia during lockdown, um, homeschooling, online learning has been, been a challenge. I've learned a lot of, of, of uh, French and uh, Japanese feudal history, so that's been quite interesting, but it has been, has been a challenge. So, so, you know, we all need to unwind. Um, so I'm quite an avid guitarist, electric guitar, so I have, I have, a, I have a few of those. And I, I set myself a challenge before the pandemic started, or sorry, before lockdown started, I should say, of trying to learn all the guitar parts from Led Zeppelin II, which is, which are, and I've done okay. Heartbreak is kind of still giving me a bit of trouble. So I've just tried to kind of focus by, um, my inner Jimmy Page coming out and failing. I haven't got, got the hair for it, but I've had a go anyway. 
Oh, that's fantastic. I'm not sure if I've ever shared with you that I have this wish to bring together all the musically inclined and talented fellows of the Australian Academy of Science to jam together. Uh, and that would take collaboration <laughs> to another level, I think. It's been fascinating speaking with you. I know you've still got a lot to contribute to science and to society. And to be honest, you're a hero to many scientists and to me personally. So please keep up your extraordinary work. We need independent science to inform our policies and future directions. Eddie Holmes, it's been my pleasure to talk with you today. Congratulations again on being awarded the Prime Minister's Science Prize, and we are so proud to call you a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science. Thank you, it's been a great pleasure talking to you.